Hey all here at OS Reviews, today we're taking a closer look at the Yumadigi Bison Pro. This is a rugged Android smartphone that is also relatively price conscious. In fact, you can find the base model for around 170 bucks. There's also a version that sells for $190 that gets you an upgraded 8 gigabytes of built-in RAM, which is, I have to say, very competitive for the price. And it also packs a MediaTek Helio G80 processor, which is octa-core and clocked at 2 gigahertz. So this processor is going to be a little bit faster than the predecessor, which was the original Bison that came out earlier in the year that used the MediaTek Helio P60. In terms of benchmarks, this new G80 is about 20% higher in terms of Antutu. The accents here that they've coated in rubber, making it shockproof. It's also going to be fully waterproof, so you can even dunk this into a pool. Unfortunately, it does have just a rear kind of mono speaker, but we also have a camera cluster composing of a 48 megapixel sensor from Sony, along with a dual tone LED flash. 16 megapixel wide angle lens, which is 117 degrees, and a 5 megapixel micro lens, which is not really as great, but it's there. And we also have a thermometer built on in. This is one of the other features that is new on the Bison Pro compared to the earlier Bison. Of course, I personally think it's a little bit of a gimmicky function, but if you do want to measure someone's temperature in a, in a pinch to see if they have a fever, it's now built on in. You can also measure the temperature of other objects, including food as well. So it does have a few uses. Now we also have a barometer for measuring your air pressure that's also built on in, including a compass, there is NFC on here for a contactless payment, 4G LTE unlocked quad band, and otherwise doesn't have wireless charging, but pretty much everything else has been built in, including support for a few customizable shortcut keys, one on the left and one on the right, just like before, which you can program to launch different things at a click, which is neat. The rails here are made out of aluminum and feel pretty tactile and responsive. We still have a standard headphone jack on the top, and aside from the 128 gigs of built-in storage, which by the way is pretty good for this price, you also can expand that further. Finally, there is a side-mounted fingerprint scanner, which I have found to be pretty good and responsive in testing. Placement is easy to reach and it takes just a split second to unlock, usually works a little bit faster than some of the newer under-display fingerprint scanners. It's not the fastest in the world, but it's reliable. Now otherwise, the screen on the front, we are looking at a 6.3 inch Full HD 1080 plus IPS LCD display. So it has pretty decent viewing angles, but arguably it can get a tad brighter that would be even better since it is marketed as a outdoor rugged phone. Colors do look quite punchy and vibrant, which is good. Now otherwise we do have a little bit of a bezel, but not too bad. Overall still is decent in terms of its compactness for a rugged phone, packing a 5000 milliamp hour capacity battery, which by the way can be charged using 18 watts charging using type C, taking around two hours or so to fully charge up, so not the fastest, but also not bad considering we have a relatively large size built on in. Now there's also a front facing 24 megapixel Sony lens for the selfie camera, which is also decent. To be honest, the camera sensors on this phone haven't been really upgraded compared to the original Bison, which packed pretty similar specifications. In fact, they're using almost identical parts there, but that's not a bad thing. That phone did pretty well for a budget device. Here is the interface. It's pretty simple, but we have the ability to toggle between the modes like a ultra wide just by tapping on that dot over there. And it does take a moment to kind of process. It's not quite as instantaneous again as a flagship processor, but not bad. There's also the aforementioned micro lens that you can tap on the other side to activate. In this mode, you have to be within just a few centimeters of your object. Some folks say that micro lenses can be a little bit gimmicky. They would rather see, let's say, a zoom lens, for example, but overall I still think that it, there are cases where it can be fun to play around with, and under extra you can also find a panorama mode, a pro mode that does give you more granular level of control over things like ISO and exposure, which is nice, and you can even find a night mode, although this is no match for let's say the iPhone or Pixel, but it's still neat to have and can slightly brighten up images if you are in slightly darker environments. But again, there is no optical image stabilization, so you still have to hold relatively still there. You do get a AI mode, which can intelligently detect what you're pointing at and slightly change the properties of the photo, including the colors. For example, pointed at this flower, and you'll see that it is recognized that it is 
truly a flower. And right now it's just bumped up the kind of exposure, the colors, the saturation a little bit. Versus if we now have a piece of paper here, you can see that it will recognize that this is text. And here's a closer look at some additional images I was taking with it recently, including some close-up micro shots. Again, that micro lens at 5 megapixels, it's not going to be the sharpest and definitely will struggle under movement, but it can still be fun to occasionally play around with. Here is one taken with just the regular sensor, identifying this as a plant. And overall, not too bad if you are in brightly lit environments. At least uh, you can still get plenty of detail with the main 48 megapixel sensor for zooming in and cropping in. It's nothing extraordinary, especially here in 2021 standards where we expect a lot now from our smartphone cameras. But definitely for a budget phone, I would say it does the trick. A few more samples with the close-up lens, which again is actually pretty fun to occasionally play around with. Video quality, on the other hand, is just so-so. Again, there's no stabilization, so it can be a little bit jumpy, but in brighter environments it works just fine, and you can capture up to full HD, but no 4K. As far as screen on time, I'm getting roughly 7 hours or so, uh, and that is with moderate usage with Wi-Fi turned on, watching some YouTube videos. Again, that is decent, and especially with the larger battery here, it's definitely going to get you at least through a day, if not longer, if you are using it even lighter, uh, and overall, definitely no issues here in terms of battery endurance. The overall software experience, which is powered by Android 11, is also fairly up-to-date, even though I know Android 12 has officially dropped just last week, but uh, for what it is, it still feels pretty fresh in terms of having access to all of the typical functions, swipes in terms of gestures for multitasking, things do look pretty clean and we don't really have too much bloatware going on, which is good. And in this toolbox, we have things like the aforementioned thermometer. Uh, for the most part, it actually is not bad in terms of its accuracy. It's definitely been improved compared to the Umidigi A9, which I found it to be a little bit hit or miss in terms of at times you needed to do a few measurements to get it working. But on here, it actually kind of works on the first try, which is pretty neat. Just point it kind of a few centimeters away from whatever object and then just tap on measure and it will get you the measurement there just in a second. Afterwards, you can also save your records and take a closer look at how things have fluctuated. Other functions on here include the aforementioned barometer, a basic compass which is also built on in, nothing really too new, but uh, you can also find these on here, which is neat. Like I mentioned, overall, it's not bad in terms of the responsiveness, um, and overall the Helio G80 is a relatively decent mid-tier processor. Performance is comparable to a Qualcomm Snapdragon 710 and a little bit faster than the older Snapdragon 660, 665. So we have the standard Gboard that's built on in by default, by the way. Pretty responsive. Screen is coated using Corning Gorilla Glass as well, so no issues in terms of touch sensitivity. And overall, Wi-Fi reception also seems to be pretty strong using dual-band Wi-Fi, although it doesn't support Wi-Fi 6 on this model. Uh, but overall, no issues in terms of loading back pages, even complex ones. We can, in fact, try toggling into, let's say, desktop mode and see what happens there. Overall, again, respectable for doing simple web browsing related tasks. The one thing to keep in mind though is the aforementioned dual variants of this phone. So there is that base model that comes with four gigs and then that other upgraded model for $20 more, you're getting eight gigabytes of RAM. Even though everything else from processor to screen to built-in 128 gigs of storage are exactly the same, I do think that extra $20 will go a long way because doubling the RAM can definitely help you in things like multitasking, opening up even more tabs in the browser, and also more demanding games in general, without having to clear up things running in the background. The takeaway is the speaker, I would say, is just so-so. At the very least, if you're lying it flat, it doesn't get completely muffled because there's a raised edge that is propping it up. However, I definitely would have preferred stereo speakers, and uh, to be honest, for a kind of outdoor phone, it can definitely be a little bit louder, but for what it is, it's okay. At the very least, you can always use wireless headphones or headphone jack because there is one built on in. And overall, you can definitely enjoy watching YouTube videos, Netflix shows. Kind of the last component of here, I would just talk about briefly the gaming compared to other entry-level and mid-tier devices. Again, it's not going to be um, a rival to the 
top of the line chipsets, but still is going to be stronger than average. And definitely in this particular regard, I found the phone as a whole to still get relatively cool in terms of the back of the device. If you're holding it, it doesn't feel too warm or anything like that, even as you are gaming for more than 30 minutes. And that is thanks to Yumidigi having pretty decent heat dissipation. And as a result, most moderate and mid-tier games, you really won't find too much of an issue on here. Of course, the most demanding of games, things like PUBG and Asphalt, you will still probably have a better experience if you slightly lower some of the settings, but um, overall, it's definitely not too bad. Respectable for an entry-level phone as far as the fluidity that I'm seeing, especially Especially in the majority of lighter games and even if you wanted to try heavier games, they are still playable. Uh, maybe they're not going to be perfect in terms of frame rates, but uh, definitely is surprisingly decent. The Helio G80 I do think is a nice choice for the price to performance ratio. Basic elements of this device, including making phone calls, also really didn't have any issues when testing it with both AT&T and T-Mobile in the Seattle region. I found it to be pretty good in terms of reception strength, and the microphone picked up my voice without too much complaints there. So that is more or less it as far as our just quick hands-on review of the Yumidigi Bison Pro. I like it a lot, I have to say, for the price, since it's relatively affordable for a rugged phone. Again, the selling price here compared to the other alternatives, which can be powered by similar chipsets, aren't really going for too much more. But on here, we do have a model that has a bigger battery, has more resistance to water, especially if you're someone that goes a little bit more rough on your device. It's not necessarily a huge upgrade compared to the original Bison, so if you already have that phone, this is not going to be really an upgrade that makes too much sense. But if you are on the market looking for a new Android smartphone, you want something with slightly more resistance to wear and tear, and you're looking at a model for under 200 bucks, this is not a bad choice to consider. You can check out more details if you're interested in the links down below. For now, that's been our video. Thanks for watching here at OS Reviews.